Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here today and uh, here to worship and celebrate with us. Today we're going to be looking in the book of Luke. We're going to look at the story of Jesus dealing with a man who is possessed by demons and, and the power and authority that came through Jesus Christ. It says the chains couldn't hold him. Uh, he would break free from them and bust the shackles, all those things. But that chains weren't really what were binding him. It was the power of the enemy over his life. And it was Jesus that was needed to come to, to break those chains and to set them free. The second song we're going to sing this morning is about that. My chains are gone. I've been set free. And, and the first song is are 10,000 reasons that we give praise to our God. And So I just want you to keep in mind, what is it that has uh, got a hold on your life today? That the enemy has got some uh, advantage in your life. And we just as you sing these songs, that you'll set those things before the foot of the cross and ask the Lord to break those chains and to set you free. So let's stand and let's start by saying together there were 10,000 reasons. Amen. Please have a seat if you would. We're back to uh, Luke chapter 8 if you'd like to turn there as we get started this morning. I've shared the story before and maybe you've heard it. There was a, uh, an acrobat, I guess is what you'd call him, way back in the day. His name was Blondin or something like that. And he often, a number of times, had stretched a tightrope across the uh, Niagara Falls and walked across it back and forth. Have you seen the thing on Facebook recently of the guy up on that 1,500-foot tower? They climbed that tower and the camera goes, and this question was asked, would you do this? <laughs> no way. Absolutely not. I guess if my kid's life or my wife's life depended on it, I would, but no other reason I can think of. Uh, anyway, he, he walked across this tightrope on Niagara Falls, and he got over to cheering crowds. They were just in awe and amazement of him. And he says, I am the amazing Blondin. He says, I'm going to walk back across, and this time I'm going to carry another person on my back. Do you believe I can do it? We believe, we believe. And then he says, who will be that person? <laughs> We can say a lot of things. Now, if you really believed that he could walk across there without dropping you, really, really believed that, that you wouldn't fall, why not go? And they didn't really believe. We talked, now last week we jumped way ahead and went to Luke 15 for whatever reasons God had. We went there, but we're back, back where we were. We, we looked at the story of the parable of the sower last, uh, two weeks ago. And we talked about the fact that Jesus says, those who have ears, let them hear. It wasn't so much his message that he needed to tweak, it was the hearing that needed to be tweaked. How we hear and how we obey what we hear. That his message and the power of the word of God is highly affected by how it gets filtered through our ears and how we take that in. We see the same thing here in this. We're going to look at actually two stories in Luke 8. We're going to talk about Jesus in a boat and a storm, and Jesus healing a demoniac that he runs into on the other side of the water. And we find here that Jesus gets frustrated, not with his ability and his power, but with our inability and our lack of belief. That, so it's not only how we hear, but it's how we believe, how we have faith in what God is capable of doing. I've always struggled with this in my life. That I want... Whatever is possible with God. If he can heal people through Jesus and through Paul and through the disciples, I want to be involved in that. Resurrections, that would be awesome. I'd get a lot of funerals, wouldn't I? If, if we were involved in that process. Unless it was your mother-in-law, then you might not have me do your... And I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I want whatever has, God has available to us. And what he has available as God is everything. And what limits that to my frustration and anger is my own heart and my belief where God asks me, do you believe I can go back across the tightrope with someone on my back? Yes, I believe. Will you go with me? I'm not so sure about that. So I want to look with me, Luke chapter 8. We're going to see Jesus with his disciples. Uh, verse uh, 22. Now one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat and he said to them, 
Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. Now remember, this is Jesus. And he says, we're going to the other side of the lake. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake. And they began to be swamped and to be in danger. And they came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves. And they stopped and became calm. Now here, notice what Jesus says. And he said to them, where is your faith? Now what does that mean? Was it that they didn't have faith to stop the wind and the waves themselves? Or was there a lack of faith in the fact that they didn't think they were going to get to the other side of the water? That they were going to die, in other words. Remember Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side of the lake. And Jesus says, well, where's your faith? If I say we're going to the other side of the lake, guess where we're going? Other side of the lake. Well, they think, well, maybe we get there, but we're floating dead. <laughs> no, he, he said, where's your faith? Can't you trust that if I say we're doing this, we're doing this? And I can walk across the tightrope and take someone with me. You go with me. Uh, not so much. And it says, where is your faith? Not his, or not his ability to stop the ways, but where's your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? He's the Son of God, the Son of the Most High God, and he's saying, You need to trust that I am that. And that I can do things above and beyond what we think are possible. And so they're astonished, and they just had this experience. And so it all calms down, they get to the other side, and they get to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, Verse 26, the next story happens. Then they sailed to the country of uh, Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And by the way, this is, there are um, Gentile peoples over on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And there's a Decapolis, which is about 10 cities that are right there. Uh, there's a lot of Gentiles in them, so it's not as much Jewish, but there's certainly a heavy Jewish influence there. That'll come up in a minute. Verse 27, and when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, plural, and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in the house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Now just stop there for a minute. Jesus has asked his disciples, where's your faith? Don't you know who I am? Don't you think I can get accomplished what I say I'm going to get accomplished? And here we find out that this is the demon speaking through this man. He knows exactly who Jesus is. Even when the disciples don't, he says, you are the son of the most high God. What business do we have with each other? Meaning, not now. This isn't our time. This isn't when you're coming and putting us all down. This isn't our time to, to meet up necessarily. And, and it says, I beg you not to torment me. Isn't it interesting? These demons had more faith in Jesus' ability than the disciples did. So here's my, my tagline for today. Be more faithful than the demons. All right? That's your goal. To have more faith than the demons have. All right? And these guys know exactly who he is and what he's capable of, and what they are incapable of in his presence. They knew his power that was given to him by God was limitless, and they had no control to do anything other than what he decided. And so notice it says they're begging him not to torment them. Verse 29, For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. And he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds and be driven by demons into the desert. Just stop there for a moment. We, we've talked about other uh, demon possessions before, periodically, and one was in the book of Acts, where one man who was demon-possessed overpowered uh, the sons of Sceva, all of them, and chased them out of the house. There seems to be a supernatural strength that comes with this. We're going to look at Mark 5 in a minute that he broke the chains and would bust the shackles to pieces. How strong he was. 
In verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he wasn't asking the man. He was asking the demon who was speaking through the man. What is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. Again, in Mark 5, it answers, legion, for we are many. So this man had not one, but many demons in him. And they were imploring him, they meaning the demons, were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. So they're begging him again not to command them to go away. They knew they had no power and authority over what Jesus said or did. They were understood unequivocally that they were under his control. They had more faith than the disciples had. Their faith was great in the power of Jesus Christ. And so they're begging him not to send us into the abyss, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on that necessarily, but it seems to be a unique place. We see it in, talked about in Jude, verse 6, and Revelation in a couple places. It seems to be a place where uh, fallen angels, demons, which is the same thing, can be locked up, permanently locked up, where they're not out roaming and causing trouble. We don't have a lot of time getting in, but Genesis 6 is a story where the sons of God uh, came and slept with the daughters of men. Uh, the best, my best understanding of that whole story is that these angels, fallen angels, came and had children with, with human women. And it says from that came the Nephilim, or the giants. That there was a unique thing, unique thing going on there. And God took those angels that did that and locked them up, it says, in eternal chains. In Jude 6. Jude, there's only one chapter, so Jude verse 6 talks about that, that they were held up in eternal chains. God was sending the message that this isn't going to continue on. So those demons have no more roaming allowed. They are locked up. And that's what these guys are worried about. They're going to get sent to the abyss and get locked up and not have any freedom of movement. And he says, don't torment us. Don't send us to the abyss to lock us up. Verse 32. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. Now, I don't know exactly what this is. If you know Jewish law, uh, swine, pigs were unclean animals. They were not allowed in the Jewish world. And which is why I think they were so angry. They had no bacon. Um, so, was this Gentile swine herders that had a herd of swine? Or were they Jewish swine herders hiding on the east side of the Sea of Galilee having a black market barbecue program going on? Come over to the east side, we'll get you some bacon. <laughs> east side. Something like that. <laughs> I'm not very hip. Anyway, <laughs> come over here, we'll get you, we'll get you some barbecue and then hook you up with some ham and bacon. Uh, so I don't know if there's some kind of black market thing going on over here or not. And which may, if it was Jewish, that may be why he went ahead and, and had these pigs run into the ocean and drown into the sea it was because what they were doing was unclean as well and they knew that and they were hiding out over on the east side and uh, and uh, we're doing this black market hog thing going on over there so all, as we know all hog farmers are uh, unclean so <laughs> hiding behind the Bible John won't fix it so they, it's, it's interesting here, it says, they were imploring him, imploring him verse 31, not, and not to command them to go away into the abyss. And so he said, here's a herd of swine. They were feeding on the mountain. And the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission. That's the line I have up on our slide. I, I pick one line out from every passage we're working on through Luke that I think is the most important. We, we get this impression sometimes that the enemy just has so much influence over us 
that uh, Satan and his minions just mess with us at will. That they just seem to have unlimited power in this world. It is not the case. They were begging him to give them permission to go. In other words, they knew they had absolutely no choice in the matter what was happening to them. They were standing before the Son of the Most High God. And they had no choice what was going to happen. So that all they can do is beg for permission to leave the guy, which they knew they were doing. They had faith that they were leaving. And they didn't want to go to the abyss where they would be eternally bound, best as I can understand. And they didn't want to be roaming. They wanted to inhabit something and torment something. That's, I guess, what they do. I don't understand all that. And so they said, here's a bunch of swine. Can you give us permission to go over there? And it says, he gave them permission. I need us to understand, which is the main point of the message today, that the God we serve and our Lord Jesus Christ have absolute dominion over the forces of the enemy. Absolute dominion. There's nothing they can get done that God does not allow them to do. They have to get permission. If you remember the book of Job, right? Satan comes up and, and he's having this conversation with God and he says, you know, uh, God says, what about Job? He's a good man. And he says, yes, yeah, because you protect him. You take your protection off and you let me have my way with him, he'll curse you. He had asked for permission for that to happen. And I just love that line. He gave them permission. They had no choice. Absolutely none. It wasn't, you know, like some of the movies we see where, you know, the enemy seems to have the advantage in these supernatural events and, and Christians are just, you know, weak. It says he had, they had to get permission from him. And he gave it to him. As verse 33, And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. And when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran and reported it in the city and out in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demon had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. That's a strange reaction, isn't it? you think they'd be excited that this man that they couldn't control. And we won't have time to probably look at it today, but back in Mark 5 is the same story with, with more detail. Not only was this man out there, but he would take rocks and cut himself and gash himself and screaming and it says they tried to chain him and shackle him, and they couldn't. He would bust everything that he had. He was a terror to them, screaming day and night and cutting himself. And they couldn't control him. And then Jesus comes and, and does this miracle. And, and, they all, and the herdsmen, they're not complaining to Jesus about destroying their swine. And by the way, back in the book of Mark, chapter 5, we find out it was about 2,000. 2,000 head went down into the water. Now why is that important? Because that's possibly how many demons this guy had in him. Legion, a Roman legion had up from anywhere from 1,000 to 6,000 men in it. And so when he says we are legion, we get the idea that maybe God was making a point through what Jesus was doing here, that it wasn't that Jesus can control just one demon, but he can control 2,000 with just a word of permission. And all 2,000 picked a pig and went in it, and I don't know if this was a trick. Maybe they're hoping they just torment the pigs for a while. But maybe the Lord had them rush down the water, drown themselves, and they had to leave anyway. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know what to do with all that. But we get the idea that there was lots of them in this guy. And can you imagine the life change for this fellow? Who went from having a legion, possibly 2,000 demons messing with him, to sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. That's the God we serve. Who's given authority to, to our Lord to do this kind of work. And, and the people run into town and tell everybody what happened. They all come back out and they witness him there. They got him cleaned up and clothed now. They're probably feeding him. Probably not bacon. But they're feeding him. And he's sitting there talking for the first time. And, and so however long. And it says they became frightened. Not excited. 
but frightened. And those who had seen reported them, verse 36, how the man who had been demon possessed had been made well. And all the people in the country of, of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with fear, and he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, but he said to him, but he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. It's incredible to me that their response to this incredible act was to ask him to leave. And what does Jesus do? He leaves. The Lord will take no for an answer. If we tell him no, he's not going to force himself on us. And this isn't just the unbelievers that were there. I think it's true for us as believers. A lot of us, we want Jesus to be our Savior. We're not too crazy about him being our Lord, though. And the Lord is when he has control over our life, when, when he asks us not to live immorally, and we don't want to, we want to do it anyway. We ask him to leave that part of our life. And he will take no for an answer. We need to be careful what we ask of the Lord. We need him both Savior and Lord of our life, and we need to give him control of every aspect of our life. Now this guy wants to go with Jesus afterwards, but Jesus says, no, you need to go tell folks what the Lord has done for you, and he sends him off for evangelistic purposes to share what's going on. Now I want you to go back with me to, to Mark chapter 9. It shouldn't be too many pages back from where you're at. Back into the book of Mark, chapter 9. I want to look at another story because I want to talk about the power of God, I think, that is available to us. Now, I will t I've never cast a demon out of anyone. I've never done, been involved in a miraculous healing like you might see with the apostles. I have been involved in praying for people who have certainly received miracles and healing has taken place. But nowhere where someone's lame and we grab their hand and they stand up and walk. But I'd be excited to be involved in that. I want that. I think we all want that. But even as we say it, we're a little bit afraid of that. Like these guys, they said they saw what Jesus did and they were, and they were frightened. I remember a case of of, of a woman in one of our churches in Atlanta who had asked the elders and pastors to come pray over her husband because she felt he was possessed. And one of the pastors, maybe not a pastor, maybe he was an elder, he said, I'm not spiritually ready for that. I'm not in the right place to be there and go do that. He knew that it was serious business. But they went, and uh, I won't tell you details, but it got exciting. And some of you heard stories and maybe even been involved. Supernatural things were happening in the room with them. And the one pastor told me, first time he'd ever been involved in it, he said it was terrifying. Terrifying. Things flying around and everything. So we, we want deliverance for people. We want healing. We want those things. But there's something terrifying about it, isn't there? I guess my point today is that we would open ourselves up to whatever God has in store. Whatever he needs to do. And, you know, Paul, when he talks about gifts, he says, they're all this. Do everybody, does everybody do every gift? The answer is no. Not everyone has a gift of healing. Not everyone has this. But I think we should be open to it. And I, and I see that here in, in Mark 9, Jesus' frustration with his disciples because, again, not of his... Jesus' limited power, but of their limited belief that limits his power. Look at this story real quick. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began ringing up to greet him. Verse 16, and he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. 
I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. Now again, some people argue this is a disease, not mental, I mean mental illness or something like that, not necessarily demon possession. The Bible calls it that, so we're going with that. It could be whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever it was, they couldn't get it done. Verse 19, And he answered them and said, O oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Notice it wasn't that the power, he didn't say it was because you don't have the power available to you. He says the issue with you not being able to do this is your lack of belief. Your lack of belief. <clears throat> I don't want God's power limited in my life and in your life and in the ministry of this church because of our lack of unbelief. And this story is going to get interesting here. And he says, he actually says, how long shall I put up with you? That sounds like a parent, doesn't it? He says, bring him to me. Kind of frustrated, just bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, verse 20, and he saw him immediately, and the spirit threw him into convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling around, foaming at the mouth, and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? He says, from childhood. It has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. That seems to be the M.O., of possessions, it's, it's in the destruction of the person. And then he says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Now this, this is our heart attitude sometimes when, when somebody's sick, you know, we pray, you know, Lord heal him. And I'm not really sure we think it's going to happen. Isn't that true? Oh, he's not really going to heal him, but we'll pray it because we're supposed to. Unbelieving generation, he says. So the guy says, if you can do anything, you know, take pity on him. And Jesus said to him, verse 23, if you can, notice that, if I can, really? In other words, Jesus is at, begging us to believe that he can do it. So he makes it clear, all things are possible to what? Him who believes. Not just to me, right? But to all those who believe. Well, yeah, but it, it can't happen for us. And there we go, right? And so immediately the boy's father cried out, and this needs to be our cry today, I do believe, help my unbelief. In other words, I, intellectually I know you can, but I don't think you will, kind of thing. He says, I believe, so help my unbelief. And I think, if nothing else, we start there today for us. I believe with all my heart, we are really close to the end of the age. Am I right? I don't know. I just sense that our world is changing seriously. And if that's true, if that's true, the Bible tells us very clearly that satanic activity and the battle at the end of the age is going to be a massive spiritual battle. Are you ready and believing to fight in the spiritual realm? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Verse 25, when Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and do not enter him again. And after crying out, throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out of the boy, and the boy became so much like a corpse that most said he is dead. As Jesus took him by the hand, raised him, and got him up, when we came into the house, the disciple questioned him privately, why could we not drive it out? That's a question we all have. And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Matthew says, fasting. Matthew 17, 21 says, because of the littleness of your faith. Now if God chooses not to do these kind of miracles, what we might call big miracles through us, then that's his prerogative. But if he's not doing it because of our lack of faith, that is not okay with me. That is not okay. And Jesus is frustrated here because of their unbelieving hearts. So what's, what's the application for us today? I, th I think anything is possible. And yet we don't think most things are probable. And that's our problem. I think God wants to do more than we, we're willing to let him do that our faith is willing to let him do. He says, oh, you little faith. 
Also, I think that some of us wouldn't be ready for that spiritual fight that may be coming our way. Because we have allowed the enemy in. Now, I don't think, and this is my opinion, I don't think it's possible for a child of God who is walking with the Lord to be possessed. This, Romans 8 says that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in us. That power is the same power that dwelt in Jesus that was doing all these miraculous things. We looked last week that uh, in 1 John it says, uh, as Jesus is in the world, so are we. I think the power of God rests in us. I don't think we can be possessed, but I think we can give advantage to the enemy. And I want you to look at one more verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you'll turn there with me. I think a lot of Christians wouldn't be ready for these fights because they're not spiritually in the place where it can happen. I say that there is no power, no blessing outside of obedience. And if we are living in sin, we should not expect God to unleash this kind of power through us. And here in 2 Corinthians, this is, this is just a small thing. There's been an issue in the church, and they had to remove somebody. And he was afraid that now that he's getting restored, that they wouldn't forgive him. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, But one whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. And he goes on, verse 11, well, in verse 10, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Here we see that Paul says Satan has a scheme. A plan to take advantage of us. Not necessarily to possess us as, as believers, but to just get in to our mind we, when we let him in. And he said, if you do not forgive this guy, that unforgiving spirit is a crack in the armor that lets the enemy come in and play with our hearts and minds. Well, I suggest to you that any disobedience puts a crack in our armor and lets the enemy in and when the enemy gets in, he takes advantage of that. And when the enemy has an advantage in us, God's power cannot fully be released through us. To me, one of the lessons for the believers here this morning from this sermon is, is there sin in your life that you're not being honest with and dealing with and fixing as best you can with his power? Begin to work. It may be a process, but begin to work it. Our world is filled with immorality of every kind. Everything is okay in the world's eyes. It is not okay. We're discussing whether men should be allowed to go to women's restrooms. Why are we even talking about that? Our world is a mess. Don't you get married? Don't worry about sex before marriage? What? But the Bible says worry about that. Fornication, adultery, all those things are in the Word. It, it matters. And if as Christians we're living that way, or pornography, uh, or lust, or lying, or deception, or stealing, or greed, the list goes on and on, and we're okay with these things in our life, we should not expect the power of God to be unleashed through our lives and into our situations. Alcohol, drugs, all those things, they call them spirits for a reason, because they change our character. They let the enemy in. And he says, I do not want Satan to have any advantage over us, and we are not ignorant of his schemes. So there is a scheme, and there are ways that we let the enemy have advantage in our life. And I think as Christians, we need to begin to close those doors and do what we need to do to walk in the power of his righteousness. It says, the power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. I just think as a church we need to do everything we can to walk in obedience and power so that as the day gets closer and the end draws nearer, that as people we will have the power because God's power is in us because we are dealing with our sin, not perfect, but dealing with it, so that we can change the world as the end of this age comes on us. We're going to offer an invitation if the worship team would come up for anyone here today who hasn't accepted Christ as their Savior, we need to uh, make that change. And just like the stories that we've been looking at, 
Um, it's God that has to do the work. You know, it's interesting in Jude when he talks about all this weird stuff about the abyss and, and Michael the archangel fighting Satan over the body of Moses. Really weird story. Um, it says that people tried to take the enemy on themselves and he says even Michael didn't do that. He said the Lord rebuke you. Salvation has always belonged to the Lord. It is Jesus who sets the chains free. And we want to set you free today. So we're going to sing the song Salvation Belongs to Our God. If you're ready to give your life to Christ, we encourage you to come up. Also this morning, Austin uh, Jordan is going to be rebaptized, And uh, so as we get near the end of the song, they can come on up. And any of the family who wants to sit up front, you're welcome to do that. But we offer the invitation to anyone to stand and sing together. Salvation belongs to our God.